Thank you and welcome to everybody uh, joining us today. Uh, we have an incredible lineup on this panel to talk about skilling up governments, which is an issue that obviously everybody here cares about a lot or you wouldn't be attending this, uh, this GovTech summit, um, but has clearly become even more important um, since coronavirus with government departments and governments all over the world trying to rapidly catch up and digitize. Um, so we very much look forward to um, your participation later. But in the meantime, we have these five panelists who all have really interesting, diverse range of perspectives to bring to this discussion. So starting with um, Admiral Tony Radikin, who is the first Sea Lord and Chief of Naval Staff. We have Fiona Deans, who is the Chief Operating Officer of the Government Digital Service, or GDS, as you may know it. We have Mitchell Weiss, who is a Professor of Management Practice at Harvard Business School and who worked in government himself um, for the Mayor of Boston. We have Pamela Dow, who's Executive Director of the Government Skills and Curriculum um, Department in the Cabinet Office, and Eldred Dordan, who is CEO of GovChat.org, which is a public engagement platform used by the South African government. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, as I mentioned, and as everyone can hear from your introductions, you have a real breadth of experience here. So we're excited very much to, to hear from you. I want to start off with a, a kind of tongue-in-cheek question, but which has a serious point, and we'd love to hear from you all um, why this is important to you. But if you could give your government a uh, tech superpower with the click of a finger, uh, what would it be and why? Uh, Mitchell, could I start with you, please? Sure, um, and, and thanks for having all of us. I'm thrilled to be here. A tech, a tech superpower. I don't know if this is a tech superpower. It, it should be, but it al should also be a government power, which um, truth seeking, truth seeking. So, um, uh, a friend of mine who's a venture capitalist here in the U.S., Eric Paley, likes to say that uh, the very best entrepreneurs are not evangelizers of nonsense; they're truth seekers. And I think these days, at all, and also against the backdrop of COVID, we have tons um, of like amazing innovation and also a lot of nonsense. And it would be really impressive if if if, if we all had uh, truth truth seeking capacity uh, that we could distill the the possibility from the nonsense. Thank you, Mitchell. That's uh, that's very thoughtful. Well, if we're talking about truth seeking, then I think I'm going to uh, throw to Eldred next. Given that his work is all about kind of citizen engagement, and in democracies, we must think that sources of truth come from there. So, Eldred, <laughs> what um, superpower would you give your government? Uh, Verity, thank you again for having me on this panel. It's a huge, huge honor. Um, to answer your question around his power, I'd, I'd like to maybe align it with a superhero, like someone uh, that is South African uh, by the name of e, um, Elon Musk, uh, someone that uh, is able to dream big, but someone that has failed many, many times. And I think that many governments uh, are not dreaming big enough. Um, and I really, really think that even though there are massive risks at play, uh, when it comes to things like skill, I think that government should take risks, be bold, uh, take us as citizens in their confidence and just make it uh, we understand that uh, it is not um, possible for governments to fix countries on their, their own. That is a massive need for public-private partnerships, and uh, and so I would I would I would uh, give that to governments around the world uh, to really really dream big, even though failure will come, but to learn from it and to 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 basically rise up. That's great. Okay, so dream big, but it's okay to fail. So let's go next to somebody in the government right now to see if uh, if they have a similar view. Pamela, could we um, could we throw to you on what your tech uh, super governments would be? Awesome. Thanks very much to Verity and uh, and and public for convening us today. Um, uh, so we're going to go from the very very noble aims of truth seeking to something much more um, technocratic. Um, my superpower would be uh, the 
looking to merge large data sets uh, so that we can um, uh, really automate some of the high volume predictable routine tasks. Unfortunately, I don't think it's a tech superpower. I think it's a legal and ethical superpower that we're all trying very hard to overcome. But that would, uh, I'm sure Fiona would agree with me, the ability to just merge our data sets for machine learning, for automation would make such a difference to efficiency and effectiveness. I like it. I like it. Um, Fiona, given that you work uh, as the CEO of the Government Digital Service, um, perhaps you will have a an answer to this already that's actually my team are the superpower but what what would you what would your answer be well i hadn't thought of that but yes of course we are the superpower but i think um <laughs> i would always go for something strictly te technical so i think for me it's about um government and people working through government at the senior levels of government being to grasp and understand technologies and what power they're going to have to change the way that services are delivered um, because I think there's lots of smart evangelists in government who understand technology and it's really about communicating that and getting a, a wider understanding of how to use it that is going to make the, the difference going forward, I think. Well, and, and that's actually a, a good link to um, Admiral Radikin, who um, I'm going to ask later to talk about the, the Hobart flows and the work he's been doing to kind of upskill the Royal Navy, who of course already have many superpowers. So Admiral Radekin, what would be uh, what would be your answer to this, this question? So, uh, so thank you, Varysia. Please call me Tony. I um, I was just thinking it's, it's unfair because 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 four four superpowers have already gone, uh, and I, I was going to sort of share with <laughs> the the data piece. But the, the the other one for me, which which is I don't know if it quite qualifies as a superpower. But I think it definitely applies in terms of government and the sector. And it would be to temper the ability to say no. Because I think that one of our problems is that we struggle with the inertia of our organisations. And just listening to what Eldred said, and when I look and admire some of the things Elon Musk is able to achieve and the speed at which he does it, I think he has organizations that center around the word yes and, and and strive to make those big dreams come true and i think it's sometimes a trait of public sector that we're much more cautious and therefore we come up with all the reasons to say no and that's yeah. and that to me is is one of the things that we need to overcome thank you well that's that's a great jumping off point then for Discussion because you know Elon Musk and, and is a great example and, and, and failure being dreaming big but being allowed to fail is, is something that the tech industry has really em embraced. But um, you know Pamela just raised you know ethical concerns and obviously governments are dealing with different things than, than private business people. So to be uh, uh, play devil's advocate, Elon Musk you know haven't Tesla been accused of cutting corners before on safety. I'm not saying they have, but they've had these things thrown at them that they've had to deal with in government. You can imagine having things thrown at them even more because they're even more in, in the public spotlight, aren't they? And, and we see that now with, with just trying to launch an app. You know, it's not a company trying to launch an app, it's a government and it's everybody. So I'm curious how all of you think about that and the governments need to balance those kinds of issues with actually needing rapidly to upskill, which is exactly what a private company would deal with, but they're coming at it from a different perspective. So, uh, Mitchell, maybe I could go back to you, given that you've obviously worked, you know, in government um, in, in the States and um, for the mayor of Boston and have some really interesting experience there. How is that something that a government tackles versus, you know, an entrepreneur? And we've used Elon Musk's name, but we know that this is something that entrepreneurs in, in, um, in every company face. So what's different about government dealing with technology um, projects in, in that sense and, and what should their approach be and why, you know, to Admiral Radican's point, shouldn't they be afraid? Well, um, <clears throat> what if we focus first on how they're not different? So um, it's clear that the people in government are risk averse, right? I mean, this is what Ad Admiral's talking about and, and, um, and you know, how, how we basically get around that. I mean, people in government don't like risk. 
But the main reason that people in government don't like risk is because they're people. There's like a like a very long history, of course, of social science, which which talks about how we're all, all almost all of us are risk averse. And so I actually think the distinction between public private is not quite right. That that in much of the private sector they face risk aversion also. The question is, um, what do we do with that risk aversion? You know, how do we get that ability to basically try riskier things without taking on more risk? And so in the context of building up a skill set, you know, it's the skill set of doing things even though they're probably going to fail, right? And that's the entrepreneurial skill set, which is, you know, build, measure, learn, which is, you know, agile, which is all these skills to actually take on riskier projects without taking on more risk. That's very achievable in government. That's a skill set. Um, so, so first, I guess I'd like to observe that I think the differences aren't as vast as we make them. The, the main reason we're risk averse in government is because we're human. Um, now, that being said, I don't want to sweep under the rug, <clears throat> excuse me, all the other reasons why risk averse feels especially acute in government, right? Of course, there's a tremendous amount of public scrutiny, but by the way, as there should be, uh, which is different than the private sector. Uh, uh, of course, um, uh, people in the public sector are often responsible for being, you know, the, the sort of last resort in people's lives, food, money, uh, safety. And so, so there's different risk appetite there. Like there are very big differences, of course. These are roots verity of this risk aversion. But I think it's helpful in the first passing to, to just observe that the main root is that we're people, we don't love risk, we have to develop a skill set for doing risk and actually taking on more risk. I think the last thing we want to do in government is go to everybody and say, hey, be more innovative, take on more risk. I actually think there are much there are much better strategies. So, Eldred, perhaps I could ask you. Oh, sorry, Pamela, I'll, I'll, I'll come to you next. You, you know, you are an entrepreneur working with government, and you are trying to engage with citizens, which is something notoriously difficult to do. Is that is that for you something that might unlock the government's ability to be a bit, you know, more into risk if they can actually communicate a bit more directly with people and, and have that understanding? Or is it something different from your point of view? So I think Michael is really, really, I mean, sorry, Mitchell is really spot on in saying that government is also people. Uh, and, you know, people naturally are, are you know, look at risk very, very differently. Um, but I, I, I think that this is, again, a place where, you know, startups, uh, SMMEs is able to come forward and really help government understand the risk a lot better. And where, you know, they have been in a specific industry specifically around things like 4IR, um, 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 automation, uh, the Internet of Things. Where governments, where this is new for, for like governments, things like cybersecurity, data privacy, these these concepts, these terms are fairly new for governments around the world, and pretty slow adopters of these terms um, as well. And so, I think that there is a big need for public-private partnerships to assist governments of the world to make sense around technologies. Um, and then, 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 obviously, help them, you know, make better de de decisions going forward, specifically around data-driven ones. Um, but I, as I said, I definitely think that there's a huge um, need for public-private partnerships to make, you know, a, a sense about that risk going, going, going forward. Hey, Verity, can I respond to Aldrich just on two fronts? Please, and then we'll go to. More. So I think I think we have to be a little bit careful about adulating the private sector here um, versus the public sector. And, and, and I would just make two quick notes. One is um, maybe some of these terms are new to the public sector, but the public sector has been inventing for as long as the public sector existed. I think we have to sort of sort of do away with the myth that the public sector is not inventive. It was. Um, that's how it came to be. Um, and the second is, you know, when we when we sort of gesticulate towards the private sector as being more innovative, more experimental, I think. Um, you know, not everyone's going to agree, but but Mariana Mazzucato, I think, did a very good job of putting um, in, should have an end to that myth. Like Elon Musk's example, Eldred raised, right? Te like Elon Musk gets a start on the basis of government-backed loans. Government's always been taking risk to uh, to to facilitate the private sector in these things. So I think it's a little bit. I don't think Eldridge is is. I'm not picking on Eldridge. I don't think he's doing this uh, vehemently or or only. But I just want to. I don't think we should always look to the private sector to say 
oh, you know, they do it, we should be able to. No, we've done it before. We've done it before. The question is how do we get back to doing what we once were good at? All right, Mitchell, thanks, uh, Mitchell. So Pam, Pam but Eldred, I'll come back to you. In a I'm just gonna, I know Pat, Pamela was trying to get in, so I'm just gonna go to Pamela next. Sure. Yeah, no, I think the most important word you used a while, a while ago, Verity, was, was balance in all of this. So the, the Elon Musk story that I, that I reflect on with most relevant to what I'm doing at the moment is um, when the boys were stuck in the cave in Thailand. So Elon joined a submarine um, which is, you know, exactly what people like he, he should do. And, you know, it, it, it was never going to succeed. But, you know, I love the fact that people are thinking like that. The team that saved those boys were cavers and engineers and technicians with deep domain procedural and content knowledge of their craft. Uh, and what we need in government are the people with the craft in the skills that we need them to have and some of those are very old skills uh, and take you sort of deep deep learning to get and they need to sit alongside the people who dream big about submarines um, uh, the people who take the, the greatest degree of risk that I've seen so a prison governor who takes enormous every day in their environment uh, take take that confidently and competently when they are competent and confident in their in in their in their trade in the in the knowledge of, of what they're doing and their and the, and the confidence in the skills of their team so I, do, I don't think we should have to choose between the the, the, the Elon Musk type um, uh, qualities and the you know the, the the qualities of the people who did save the boys Okay, well, in, in which, you know, that's a really interesting point. And Fiona, perhaps I could bring you in here, because obviously the GDS um, is this kind of specialist team um, uh, within government, but fr from from my understanding, really does embed and work with um, the rest of government more widely. So does that achieve some of the balance that Pamela is talking about? Is that is that your aim? Uh, maybe you could speak to the kind of balance that, you, that you're perhaps trying to get with the GDS. Yeah, so I think um, when GDS started, mm -hmm. Um, well, coming up for 10 years ago now, it was very much um, a specialised team in government, a new kind of team that was working with agile methodologies um, that went out and did a series of exemplar projects working with different government departments, showing how they could um, take a desired outcome and use agile methodologies in order to deliver it and work in a very different way. Um, fast forward to the present, and um, many government departments have... Um, agile technology teams far bigger than GDS itself at the moment. And so GDS plays a slightly different role now. One of the most important things we do is we lead the DDAT, which is digital data and technology profession for government. And what we are doing is um, we've built a framework of um, professionals and skills that all government departments can look at and work out um, how to how to hire professionals and fit them in around that we've worked on pay frameworks because um, the pay that government offers uh, isn't necessarily in line with what the market would pay for these specialist skills so sort of working on that um, we have an academy which helps skill up people from around government as well so it's more about the um, uh, sort of accelerating power of supporting other government departments build their own teams rather than us going in and doing it all ourselves. So I think that is a, a sort of key shift. Um, and we are one of the professions in government, but there's lots of other different professions doing the same thing. So I think that's the that is the change for government at the moment is to hire in the right skills, attract them, and then ensure that people have a um, career path ahead of them when they come and work for government with this kind of background. Um, what we've seen is the sort of problems that you get to work on in government are very tricky and they're really important and they are a sort of a national scale. So it's some very exciting opportunities to offer to people who are interested in coming and working in this area. And is it something, um, I, I just want to ask if it's something that you have seen that, that that's what attracts in, if you know, we're talking, one of the questions I wanted to ask all of you today was really, okay, well, how does the public sector attract attract the, the talent that, that we need? You know, is it that sense of, of mission and, and um, social change that really that you're seeing um, attract in? And 
and, and Tony, I'd love to come to you after this and ask you a little bit about the Hobart Fellows. I think that's really tanked in, in with this. But Fiona, if, if you could just talk to that briefly. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a real, I think it's a real range of, so, you know, some, some of so UK is um, a, an award-winning um, website where, you know, if you've got a particular interest in content design, for example, service design, this is like a real um, kind of cutting edge team that you can come and work for. And, and this is like one of the best places that you can sort of practice your craft, essentially. Um, or it, you know, it could be that you want to work on, you know, some really knotty problems in uh, Ministry of Justice, um, looking at sort of of analysis of vendors, for example, um, you know that's 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 really interesting. Or it could be that you know you, you yourself um, just want to work for a a public organisation. So I think there's there's lots of different routes and reasons in that you might want to work in government, and it's not just it's not just because you sort of think it's worthy. It's actually because there's some really interesting things to work on, and in some cases, it's some of the most cutting edge um, things to work on as well. Tony, could I, I mean, some people may, um, you know, at a tech conference think, oh, you know, the first Sea Lord of the Royal Navy, I wasn't expecting to see you here, you know. Well, could you, could you talk a little bit um, for us about the Royal Navy's relationship with tech and, and how you see it kind of being part of the future and, and, and particularly, you know, why, why you were interested to do something like the Hobart Fellows and maybe tell the audience a little bit about that, please. Yes, delighted. And, and I... I think I can touch on the sort of comments that, that Pamela, Fiona and Mitchell have made. So, firstly, we want, um, we're a Royal Navy that has an amazing heritage in terms of innovation and investing in technology and, and being at the forefront of that. So everything from you know, the, the, great, uh, the great prize around an accurate chronometer that allowed uh, the UK to get the lead in terms of establishing longitude, which allowed us to then navigate the seas, which then uh, spawned so much more, whether that was the first factory producing the pulleys for our ropes on our ships, um, is a competitive advantage over others, and so on. So I think we have, this, is, this, is, this is absolutely in our tradition, and this absolutely plays to Mitchell's comment about rediscovering what it is that should be an inherent part of the public sector. Um, and, and, and so I, I am a huge advocate of that. The Pernod scheme sort of played this. We've got 30,000 people uh, in the Royal Navy. We spend six and a half billion a year. Of course, we have to sometimes go to outside help. But actually, I've got, I've got amazing people. They're young, they're committed. They've got a, 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 a phenomenal set of skills. If next, by April next year, everybody joining the Royal Navy will be joining as an apprentice. So surely I can, I can take people inside the organisation that might have uh, a, a, a bent towards innovation, um, that might want to secure some of the skills that Eldred talks about, how to be a more successful innovator. And that's what we wanted to do with the Percy Hobart scheme. But it also had some additional benefits, which I think again plays to Mitchell's comment about remember that we're all human beings. So we're a conservative organisation. We, we we end up being rank dominated. So we we set up this scheme where we were going to give people access to startups, to innovators, to understand some of the techniques that are successful elsewhere and how could they apply them in our own organisation. We made that self-selecting, so we opened it up to everybody. Um, we then asked them to apply through a, a new vehicle that we just introduced called the My Navy app, which for us was, was important in terms of, sort of stepping into that space. We said that there was no qualification in terms of, uh, in terms of your rank, so we've got, some, we've got our most junior people uh, who applied and got on the course all the way through to commander level, which is, which is a senior officer level. And the remarkable thing, well, actually it's not remarkable. It sort of proved probably a point that, that, um, that, that, that Mitchell wanted to make, is that the spread of 25 people who go on a course for three months who, who get uh, excited 
by learning these new skills. And they're already excited individuals who want to give back to the organization and want to blossom and want to change things. Well, actually, it just gave them an avenue to express their ideas, to express those ideas in a more sophisticated manner, and, and, and for it to be less about challenging the organization, but more about actually being accepted by the organization so that they can make a series of pitches in a classic Dragon's Den sense, so that we can accelerate those ideas on. But more importantly, it, it highlighted that it didn't matter about rank, it highlighted that we've got this phenomenal talent inside the organization. And it also gave us an opportunity from a bunch of people that, that have self-selected to say we want to put them in some of the areas where we're trying to be the most innovative part of our Navy. And that's another point that I think we have with, with institutions, which sort of plays to Fiona's comment. We people and we, we put them into various categories. They might be a, a radar operator, they might be a, a marine engineer, they might be... We, we then could invent a career structure for them to follow that. And I, I don't want them to follow that career structure. I want them to do something else. But if they do something else, they then can't get promoted. So it kind of reveals the bureaucracy holds them back. We, we, um, we aptitude test cyber with our people. We've got a phenomenal people who have the ability to become cyber specialists but if I I've then got to find out a way that enables them to 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 fulfill that skill base but actually also to pursue a career in a new part of the organization and so that's that's what I'm trying to do try to bring up this amazing talent but also challenge the organization as to how we trust our bureaucracy to allow these people to flourish. And I think we should be really confident that we've got the foundations to allow people to flourish, but we've also got to be very aggressive about knocking down some of the walls, sometimes stop those people from, from, from progressing as they should do. That's really interesting. So I th I'm, I'm hearing quite strongly from, from all of you, I think, on the panel, that actually the talent is there in government and needs to be brought out. Um, and that the, the kind of the the mission is there and the excitement is there to, to do good. So if I may kind of, again, play devil here, what's the problem then? You know, is it, as as Tony said, is it is it just the bureaucracy? Um, because we we know that the governments just have a very bad rep when it comes to to, to use of tech. But but really what we're hearing here and, and, and certainly my experience, that's not that's not it's not, it's not really fair characterization there's some incredibly innovative things that come out of government often and innovative people so so how do we um you know if that's correct so that's the right characterization then how do we break down those misconceptions and and sort of move forward on a, on a more positive level for, te for tech and government or you know or is that the wrong characterization i and I'll, I'll go to to anybody here if if they have a strong um view uh, on that straight away and if not i'll call on someone I can come in really quickly with my, with my assessment. Of the I mean, I think it's never one thing, is it? There's always lots of answers to complex problems. Um, uh, I think there is a there is an issue with 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 the hierarchy and and, and sort of bureaucracy in the way we've always done things. Just as highlights, um, one of the things that we talk about a lot at the moment is you ask someone what they do in in the civil service, particularly the sort of central civil service, and they'll tell you what grades they are or what team they're in, and they they. they we want to affect is that they say, well, I'm actually working on kind of, you know, um, d d delivering delivering welfare payments at pace because we've to, you know, increase them five thousand fold over the last six months. That's a much more. It's a, it's a much more more exciting and, uh, and rewarding thing for the person telling you that story rather than what grade they're at. But it's also, you know, a much better sort of recruitment tool, uh, isn't it? Um, so I think that is a problem. I also think I would. Um, you, when you said Verity, I think you know we're all saying we've got the talent up to a point, and um, we've got potential, bags of potential. We've got we've got generation coming in who really want to work on this stuff. But um, uh, uh, we we do need to equip people with with the skills and. And training they need, which is, you know, um, 
back to what I'm trying to do at the moment. Um, but I am um, the final thing that, uh, that that may be a controversial thing to say in this fora uh, is. Um, uh, but I know I've spoken uh, about it to, to to colleagues at public, so I hope they don't mind. And um, there is a bit of a neophilia around this area. There's a bit of there's a bit of capital I innovation team or fellow or whatever it might be, and everyone gets very excited and puts some funding behind it. Um, but the, the put and the person you know may or may not achieve great things for a for a discrete period of time with the wind behind them air cover etc etc and what we need to do and why i really um uh you know respect sort of thinking behind the percy hobart fellowships it's not just about that sort of hackathon or dragon's den moment it's about how you then change the system to accommodate it you know, what we don't want is a load of small projects that sort of fizzle out what we want is that is the project that innovates and then becomes the becomes the system changer um andy haldane has a brilliant uh, uh, uh sort of speech about the product puzzle that I often sort of apply in lots of different ways and he makes this distinction between R&D, we always conflate R&D and actually these are two very very different things and actually in the in you know in many parts of the UK we're pretty good at R. we make breakthroughs in in speed in 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 um in uh in you know in in, in processes but then we're really bad at, 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 at doing the very difficult and different thing of changing changing everything as a result others might recognize that Aldrich, could I come to you next on that? Because I'm I'm curious if you you know have a different perspective. Um, you know, in South Africa, I think it's it's very well known that actually in the African continent has a huge amount of um, innovation and talent. You know, that we could really learn from. Um, and I'm just curious if if that if you know if what Pamela said, uh, you know, and what what Tony was saying before kind of rings true with with your experience in South Africa and with the South African government. Yeah. So I think one thing that resonates around what Pamela said is balance. Um, amazing uh, skill in the public sector. Um, but I think, I think again, you know, looking at what we've done um, as GovChat, as a startup where we create a government impact over, let's say, three odd years, um, and then comes COVID-19, right? We then asked by the Department of uh, Social Services uh, because the South African government has created a fund that would assist uh, citizens that are in distress to work for these grants or for, for, for like social services or from social services. The challenge though is that because of COVID, we normally would need to go to a social services office um, and stand in a long queue and apply for that social services. Obviously, because of COVID, that is possible. And so what that did was it digitized the, the social relief of distress application form. And in the first day that we did that, we got well over 12,000 messages every single minute to apply for a grant. In fact, today, we have well over 5 million um, applications that we've received. We've processed well over 250 million messages. I'm going to say that, that again. <laughs> a quarter of a billion messages we were able to process uh, for the South African government around social grants. Now, that is, I think, unbelievable uh, from a partnership point of view where a small company, a startup, has the vision of digitizing government services. And then, obviously, because of COVID-19, allowing us to go and do that because in normal circumstances, you would need to go and sit in the queue at the one of two and a thousand offices, uh, uh, social security offices, and then go and stand in a queue and go and apply for it. I'll give you another example. So many people were trying to get through to the social services call center, and they can be through lots of pressure at that call center. We then took the frequently asked questions, put it in a chatbot within GovChat, 
and we were able to process well over half a million questions in the first month, saving at about 8 million rand to taxpayers and to the South African government. Now, it's because of skills around new technologies and, and automation that we were able to do that. The South African government did, did, did not you know, even think that that was possible. What we just grateful for is that they have the right to allow for these partnerships because what we're also seeing is that there are many governments that don't understand this. So when we talk about risk, this is what they're worried about. Um, and we are seeing that more governments are coming forward to kind of use technologies and skills like this to make data decisions and then have a better outcome, making sure that there is a smarter country, a smarter government going forward. So I definitely think if we are able to pass things out, uh, I think that we are going to see a lot better and quality of services that is provided by the public sector to citizens of that country. I hope that makes sense. It does. That, that's, uh, that's, that's incredible. Um, I'm actually keen to throw to Mitchell next, um, you know, being um, in academia now and coming from government. I mean, you know, hearing that from Eldred, you know, what's the prize for you if, if if governments can kind of achieve that those kind that kind of that kind of reach and that kind of innovation? Well, you know, my experience is similar to Eldridge's. So, in, in when I was back in city government, I mean, for me, this canonical episode was in the wake of the Boston Marathon bombings when um, we decided to stand up a new fund to channel monies from the world towards these survivors and the families of these victims. And we were told at that minute, you know, you shouldn't do that. Government can't do new things. But we did we did anyways. And it's this, it's this Eldritch says, yes, in a crisis, we can do it. How come we can't do it more often? And I'm with him. And um, so the question is, how come we can't do it more often? How come we can't? And, and for me, it's a question of chasing possibility, not just in these moments of crisis, but also um, all the time so that we don't always end up in these moments of crisis. Or more so that we recognize we're always sitting in moments of crisis. The earth is warming, um, inequality is growing, uh, kids aren't learning, people aren't eating. We're, we're sitting amidst a vast trove of crises. We don't need to wait for some catalytic moment to try things. So Elder Trey's great point. Why can't he do this, right, uh, in 2019? Why does he have to wait until 2020? And so I think the skill set that we're trying to basically um, create more of in government is a possibility skill set, right? The, the skills we've honed over the course of the last many decades have been these probability skills. You know, how do we go after things that are probably going to work? But the dirty little secret is they, they lead to sort of middling or mediocre outcomes. And so how do we develop a possibility skill set that we can use and deploy like much more often, not only in moments of crisis? Again, not everywhere and all the time. I don't think the Admiral wants us, you know, chasing possibility on his you know, nuclear submarines all the time. But much more often than we currently do, we could we could we could be more inventive. And I, and, and I think the big challenge for you say ask what the big, big prize is verity the big prize is if we can build up our our you know uh, what, what jim march would have called our explore skills our functionality in government we could actually solve problems before the crises arrive that would be the giant prize we wouldn't this 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 saying you know never let a crisis go to waste right that's actually terrible advice in the sense of why wait for the crisis yeah well, T Tony, please. Yeah, I was going to go to you next. Could you could you jump so, in here? Do you, do you do you want us being active with your nuclear submarines? <laughs> no, I think Mitchell's right. <laughs> uh, there's a there's a limit. Um, but um, I think when you unravel what is it in a crisis and what does it provoke? I think definitely from a from a military perspective, we would say that it creates a unity of purpose. And then when you have that unity of purpose that then enables the organization to respond in a much more effective way. And my view would be that in bureaucracies, which I absolutely see as existing in the private sector and the public sector, that, that actually bureaucracies, when you, your point about what do we need to overcome, to me, what we learn from a crisis and that unity of purpose is that we become more out, outcome focused. 
Whereas actually, I think traditional businesses, when they get large, uh, they end up becoming slightly self-serving, and therefore they then, you know, that accentuates those those negative behaviours, which is risk averse and so on. And that's why you then and you then get to the absurdium position where it's easier to spend a hundred million pounds on something that is existing than it is to spend a million pounds on something that might be novel and interesting. So to me, it's understanding it's this unity of purpose and outcome focus, and that tends to come to the fore in a crisis, but actually those are elements that you can pursue all the time. You don't need a crisis. Pamela, I can see you nodding vigorously to that. Could I ask you to, to comment on that from you know from a from a government angle? I know you've worked in the private sector as well, so yeah. Um, uh, well, I'll start. I'll start then. So, so, so I um, one of the things that many people who, who started in the private sector are sort of slightly baffled by when they when they come into Whitehall um, is this distinction between capital P policy and delivery and capital ops. If I could do one thing, if I had one um, civil service superpower, it would just be to end this distinction because it is, it is not relevant and it is particularly irrelevant right now. So um, uh, one of the one of the things that you know is, is, is a matter of public record now because uh, ev everyone from parliament to think tanks have commented on it. Over the last year, in preparing for EU exit and in COVID, we have relied on military planners. They have been brought into our teams. We have used their we have used their uh, working and it is because as you know as, as, as Tony outlines that you see of um, uh, you know mobilization from the point of deciding your objective and then delivering it you know those those should be skills that are that, that, that are part of the you know the the, the procedural knowledge of, of service administration but it's not been the way um, uh, and, and I you know many reasons for that but but I think there was a time when you before modern modern government became as complex as it is that you could have the sort of policy thinkers and, and makers and and the deliverers and that and that that, that was a that was a sort of meaningful distinction it, I, I, it's just not anymore. But the, the, the point I was going to make was about, you know, show, show me the show me the behavior and I'll show you the incentive. And the incentive here for for not wanting to do the new thing, and Antonia completely recognize it is so much easier to spend 200 million quid than it is to spend 20 quid, frankly, sometimes. Um uh but the but the, the this the the way we the way we get people to overcome this is by um is by shining a spotlight and be better at uh, assessing and exposing the opportunity cost. So, as Mitchell says, we are always crisis. Um, there are, you know, there are there are kids leaving school who can't read and write, and they are they are costing the state a lot of money, and they are ruining they are ruining their own life chances. And you know, we are always in crisis. But the the um, the National Audit Office and the Select Committee are much more likely to uh, to be critical of a new thing than they are to say that school's been failing for 20 years or that system has been failing for 20 years and the opportunity cost of that is so massive that you know almost almost any change is 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 worth is worth taking the risk on well i think we have to go to um questions now but we obviously we keep talking about <laughs> about this all day um before we do i guess um i'm really struck by um you know what all of you are saying and i think kind of summarized by by tony's um phrase of you know unity of purpose so perhaps before we go to to the questions i could just ask all of you to to say you know what what should that be then you know how do the you know whether it be public private partnerships whether it be just the public sector or the private sector to to, to be motivated to work with them you know what's that kind of unity of purpose from 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 your point of view that we should be working towards is it is it a kind of a grand social change aim is it a more narrow um uh specific goal you know how would you how would you do that and maybe tony since it was your phrase maybe i could I'd throw to you first with a generalization so i would i would i would say it's outcomes i i i worry that we don't always have organizations that are focused on outcomes i want i want um i want i want people to be almost zealots in we are linking up with industry to build some magnificent new ships i want those ships to arrive on time i want them to be a fantastic quality and i want them to yeah. cost for the price that we contract 
and I want an organization that, that has a sort of zealotry in terms of shape chasing those outcomes. Um, and so I, if whatever we choose to do, really focus on the outcome. Mitchell. Um, I would say um, uh, reinventing democracy. Of all the tools, you know, we, we develop all these tools around possibility government and public entrepreneurship and innovation. And then you ask, you ask Verity, you know, what should we turn them towards? What should be our purpose? We should turn them towards, towards, towards reinventing democracy. You know, scholars have pointed out that we have a democratic recession around the world. To me, this is the biggest threat to humankind. And what I would love to see government and, and tech get together and get together much better on than they currently are is, is uh, reinventing, reinvigorating our democracies. Thanks, Pamela. Um, yeah, those are, those, are, those are two games and I agree with them both. Um, the line that's going through in my head at the moment, because it was a line that really resonated with a lot of my colleagues when um, Michael Gove used it earlier in the year in a speech, was, um, uh, you know, public service is a privilege because by our efforts, others stand tall. And I think I, I don't want to be prescribing what are what are the, the specifics of a unity of purpose are, but just by our efforts, others stand taller. So whatever you're trying to do, is it? I mean, this is it's another way of making Tony's point. I think whatever you're trying to do, um, uh, you're you're doing it for for for, for public service. Um, uh, mm. And if you keep that in mind, um, you know the the. the the, the, the sand pit that is the, the, the civil service and you know I, I want to create it so that it's so that it's enabling not constraining you thank you yeah Eldred so I'm going to say I think we I think that we should go back to being in service there is something about serving your country that is magical and whether you in the private sector or in the public sector, there's nothing like serving. Um, and serve with purpose, we really bring our quality, the way that we um, do things. And then I'd say that the output is just gonna be an amazing one. You know, so so if we could if we could serve, I think that things things all change you know so so yeah thank you Eldred yeah I mean I really hope that you know people working in in tech you know listening to this can kind of hear this this passion and this this purpose and really feeling that government is a place to direct your talent you don't have to just um uh you know go off working separately in the, in the private sector if you want to do if you want to do good and you want to and you want to be innovative um uh, with with those very um, kind of noble sentiments, I'm going to go to um, the first question that we have from the people listening in. Um, so this one was directed at Mitchell, and um, Mitchell, a request to expand a little bit more on something you said um, earlier in the panel. You said, how can we take on riskier projects without taking on more risk? Um, could you talk to that a little bit more, please? Um, particularly, you know, maybe maybe how how you think we, we we can do that, or should be thinking about it. Right. I mean, it's a great it's a great question. I don't think it's one we've <clears throat> entirely answered yet. So we'll continue to wrestle with it. But I mean, just just take for example, you know, Pamela mentioned earlier. I think it was Pamela, um, or uh, the, this notion of you know, ad, maybe it's Fiona described. They put agile, you know, sort of agile process in so much more government than it used to be. Right. And, and agile as, as compared to what? And for techies, like obviously as compared to this, this waterfall method of development. And the first step is understanding that that that, you know, beginning a project, keeping it, you know, hived off and delivering it three years from now is like a high risk way of actually delivering projects um, and, and actually delivering it in agile fashion, you know, you know, in smaller bites, build, measure, learn, et cetera, et cetera, is a better is a lower risk way to deliver projects. So the first way to basically do riskier things without actually making them riskier is is to is to chunk them down um, into smaller bites where we get uh, uh, learning. learning um, the the admiral Tony will know um, Hondo Gertz, who's assistant secretary of the U.S. Navy. He has a, a notion which I quite love, uh, which goes to the question here, which is how do you make sure that your cycle time of learning it is shorter than the circumstances you're facing. So I'll leave it here for the questioner, but one way we could actually take on more risk uh, without risk your projects rather without taking on more risk is by accelerating our pace of learning, 
making sure that the cycle time of our learning is actually shorter than the circumstances we're, we're facing. I think those would be, would be two things. Thank you, Mitchell. Did, did anyone else want to want to come in on that question before I go to the next one? I would just very quickly say um, that I mean, one technique that we uh, are trying to employ, is, and it's an exaggeration, but let's say you're a very immature startup and your risk appetite is huge. You might do things even when there's a 50-50 chance uh, of success. When you then become a bigger organization, your risk appetite decreases and you will, you'll only do new things when it's sort of 95% certain that it's going to come off. And we're trying to, so how do you become an 80% organization? So we're trying to, try to create roots and confidence so that people will try to go to be a bit bolder and a bit riskier, but they've got mechanisms whereby they can reverse out of that, that actually they understand that they haven't put their neck on the line, that they haven't sort of bet the business and so on. So it's trying to create those techniques. Because again, to, to, yeah, to, um, to Mitchell's um, point, the, ba the best baseball players are not the ones that get three out of three. They're the ones that score four out of five. So how do you become a four out of five organization, um, but do it in a way that doesn't frighten the organization or just like it's crazy and you're betting you're betting these big institutions thanks Tony. um i think we've probably only got time for one more so the next question that we've got coming in is how do we demystify risk around working with smes so small and medium-sized enterprises um Aldrin, i was going to ask you to, to to go on that one first and then anybody else um just to, that wants to get in let me know given you know, that you are a, a, you know, a startup working with the government, how do we demystify risk? I assume the question comes from the point of view, how do we de demystify the risk from the government point of view, yeah. particularly given what we've just been discussing? I'm going to give an example around mobile applications in a African context. In Africa or in South Africa, the cost of debt is still an expensive one. So building an application, a mobile application for, for, for whether it be con connecting with citizens as a government is a massive challenge. And so, you know, as GovChat, we, you know, we, were, we, we wanted to fix that problem first, a adoption, right? And so we just kept it. In, in South Africa, we have, you know, close to 30 million people that are on WhatsApp. Uh, and so what we then did was we created that integration into messaging platforms like WhatsApp. So there's a need for you to go and download a mobile application. But we are still finding governments that even though they understand adoption is a problem, are not learning, they are still going to build mobile applications. And the numbers on adoption of mobile applications on the continent is really, really poor, whether it is from a government point of view, whether it is from a telco, whether it is from a bank. If you look at subscriber numbers or the databases compared to the app downloads, it's, it doesn't make sense. And that's just because they didn't get the thing right is to understand uh, uh, the adoption part. So for me, it's about keeping things simple. If you understand that, I think you have won a lot of this risk battle. So I'm going to tell governments just to keep it simple. Learn from others. Learn from the mistakes out there, and you'll be okay. Don't try and do things and try and be cool and build more applications and say that you've got them. Learn from others. Um, that's what I'm going to say. Thank you. Thank you, Eldra. I think that's a very good note to end on. Um, so thank you so much to uh, Tony, Fiona, Eldred, Pamela and Mitchell. Uh, and thank you um, to uh, Public and, and the sponsors for hosting us. And thank you all for listening. Thanks very much. Goodbye. Thank you.